Hello friends, welcome to the first lesson of the microprocessor series. In the near future, computers are going to dominate our every walk of life, be it home, office, industry, travel, leisure and what have you. Every facet of our activity, every machine that you use are likely to be computerized within the next few years. This widespread use of computers have been made possible by this tiny electronic device called microprocessors. This small device contains thousands and thousands of electronic elements. Before we go into a detailed study of this wonderful device, let's see its wonders at work in different fields. Of course, we would find a microprocessor in every personal computer as its primary computing element. But quite often, the microprocessor is deeply embedded inside other non-computing machines. A microprocessor controls the operation of many useful devices like a photocopier, a washing machine, an automatic telephone exchange, a numerically controlled machine. It is also used in many entertaining games and toys. In this session, I will discuss the underlying concepts and the basic building blocks of a microprocessor. As we proceed along, you would realize that a microprocessor may be explained in terms of simple combinational and sequential logic elements. Also, we would introduce some conceptual framework which would be useful in understanding the working principles of a microprocessor. The function and operation of a microprocessor may be explained in three distinct viewpoints. A programmer would consider a microprocessor as a processing unit of a computer. An application engineer often looks at it as a sequential system and a hardware designer, on the other hand, looks at it as an integrated circuit. As a processing unit of a computer, the microprocessor performs arithmetic and logical operations on binary words. From the external world, it accepts digital input and provides output in various forms. It accepts machine language commands. Its behavior may be changed at will by issuing appropriate commands in binary. It can be programmed, that is, a sequence of machine language instructions called a program may be stored inside a computer and would be eventually executed by the processor step by step when called for. Such a program defines the outward behavior of the machine. As a sequential system, its behavior may be explained in terms of discrete operational steps. That is, it performs several steps in a defined sequence. As a large-scale integrated circuit, the microprocessor is a compact and economical solution to a large number of digital functions. The microprocessor comes in standard packages with limited number of pins and specified power supplies. It has, on the other hand, limits on the temperatures of operation, specified ranges of clock speed, and drive capability known as fan out.
as a computational element, a microprocessor processes binary words. The concept of a binary word is of fundamental importance. A binary word is really an array of binary symbols called bits. Each bit of this word can have either a 0 or a 1 as its logical value. In hardware, the 1 and 0 actually stands for the logical high and logical low respectively. The number of bits in a word is called its length. This figure shows 4-bit, 6-bit and 8-bit words. Words of 8-bit length is called a byte. A byte may be split into two 4-bit subwords called nibbles, each of which may be represented by a hexadecimal digit for shorthand notation. Depending on the context, a word may represent an integer, a real number, a letter, a code for something or a computer instruction. In hardware, a binary word may be stored in a register which is just an array of flip-flops. All the bits of such a register may be loaded in parallel and cleared together. The concept of a register is very important in understanding the microprocessor. The register may act as a source or a sink of a binary word. The communication between registers takes place through parallel paths known as bus. Now, we shall briefly review some combinational circuits, namely decoder, code converter, multiplexer, three-state gates, and the arithmetic logic unit. Let's discuss this one by one. A decoder accepts a binary word as input. Depending on the input word, only one of its output lines would be active. In the example shown, the input word is 3 and consequently only the output number 3 is active. As shown, a code converter converts one binary word into another word according to a predefined table. In a multiplexer, we first encounter the concept of control. The multiplexer is like a multi-position switch whereby data from only one of the input lines passes to the output. The selector arm of the input line is controlled by the selector or control input. A multiplexer has a number of data input lines A0, A1, A2 up to A7 one output line and a set of control or selector lines S0, S1 and S2. Here the selector input is 0, 1, 0, that is decimal 2. Therefore, the data from input number 2 appears in the output. In general, in a multiplexer there would be m selector lines and 2 to the power of m input lines, but only one output line. A tri-state buffer is the simplest of three state gates. It has one output, one data input and one enable line. Enabling the gate by activating the control input makes the data appear in the output like a normal buffer. Disabling the gate leads the output to a high impedance state. As shown in the figure, a multiplexer may be constructed by tri-state gates and a decoder. 
Now, let us discuss the arithmetic logic unit or the ALU. It is the most important part of a microprocessor. It accepts two binary words as input and provides one binary word as output. Basically, it is a multifunction unit. Depending on the function control input, the two input words may be added, subtracted, compared, logically ended, or complemented, etc., etc. The result of these arithmetic and logical operations appear in the output. Let us now understand the concept of a bus. The bus provides communication path between various functional parts of a microprocessor. As an example, let us establish connection among four registers. In this point-to-point -point dedicated connection, we need 12 connection paths. This is complex and uneconomical. A better alternative is to use a shared data path whereby any two registers can utilize the common line or bus to exchange data. The only shortcoming of a bus is that it can support only one source of data at a time. As a result, if two registers send or put their data at the same time, the result would be unpredictable. This is known as bus contention. In bus contention, not only the data gets corrupted, some hardware damage may also occur. Bus contention is not at all desirable. To prevent bus contention, some mechanism of access control is used, so that only one source can put data in the bus at any point of time. A simple access control may be mechanized using tri-state gates and a decoder. Depending on the selection input, only one source is allowed to put data on the bus. The other sources remain insulated from the bus due to their high impedance states. So far, we have been assuming that the bus has a single line. In practice, a bus would contain a number of lines in parallel. This is called a multi-line bus. Such multi-line buses are found in a printed circuit board, between several boards as a backplane bus, or even within an integrated circuit chip. We have completed review of combinational elements. Now, we come to sequential building blocks. The simplest of such a block in a microprocessor is a clock. Though the simplest, it acts like a conductor in the microprocessor orchestra. The clock generates square waves of fixed frequency, usually with the help of a quartz crystal. Clocked flip-flops form the other family of elementary sequential elements. D flip-flops store data for one clock cycle. We can set or reset data in an RS flip-flop or on a JK flip-flop with appropriate inputs. A register is useful because it holds data for future use. Once data is written into the register, it remains available till it is overwritten. Thus, a register keeps a word in store or memorizes it. A single bit register can be constructed by applying feedback and a tri-state buffer to an elementary D flip-flop to hold data for more than one clock period and to load it at any desired time. 
We have already seen how such enhanced flip-flops may be ganged together to form a register. As you can see from the figure, a register has a set of data input lines or write lines, a load or write enable line and the output lines. Again, a simple register may be built by an array of on-off switches. The setting of the switches decides whether a bit is 0 or 1. This register is read only. That is, its contents cannot be altered electrically. However, the contents of the switch register can be programmed or reprogrammed by setting the switches manually. Another type of read-only register uses electronic fuses in lieu of switches as shown. The content depends on whether a fuse is blown or not blown. Such read-only registers can be programmed only once. By now, I hope the concept of register is clear and we are ready to discuss the concept of computer memory. The computer memory is a long array of registers. Each register in a memory may be accessed to read its content or to overwrite the content with new data. Each register must have a unique address which is permanent, but its content may vary. The method of locating a register by its unique address is known as random access. This term would be explained further in forthcoming lessons. Let us first consolidate the idea of address in a memory. Consider this array of eight read-only registers. The output lines of each register is passed via tri-state buffers to a common bus called data output bus. The eight output buffers are controlled by a decoder. The three-bit input to the decoder, A0, A1, and A2, are called the address lines. In this case, the address is 110 binary, that is decimal 6. Therefore, the buffer number 6 would be activated and the contents of register 6 would appear in the output bus. Similarly, all the registers can be read by applying appropriate address at the address lines. Let us understand the input-output behavior of typical random access memory with the help of a specific example. This figure shows a package of read-only memory with random access provision. The four data lines indicate that each register is 4 bit wide. With the help of five address lines A0 to A4, any of the 32 registers can be accessed. The output enable or read control line may be used for timing and control of output data. A read-only memory can be used as a code converter. The input code is applied to the address lines and the output appears in the data line. The read-only memory is to be programmed according to the code conversion table. We now consider a package of read-write memory. Like a read-only memory, it has the address lines, data output lines. Additionally, it would have data input lines as well as read-write control lines. Consider another example of a read-write memory chip. It has eight common data lines, a read-write control line, the 10 address lines can locate 1024, that is 1K locations. It has also a chip select line CS, about which 
we will discuss in a subsequent lesson. Now let us compare read-write memory and a read-only memory. A read-write memory is volatile since it contains a disk write as soon as the power is switched off, but a read-only memory is non-volatile. In case of a read-write memory, data may be rewritten as many times by the microprocessor just like a magnetic cassette where we record and re-record over the same tape. In read-only memory, the data is written or programmed only once. It is like a long playing record which you can play many a times but is recorded only once. We shall now introduce the concept of an elementary sequential system as well as that of a free running state machine with the help of a binary counter. A simple binary counter is constructed by connecting JK flip-flops in cascade. Three such flip-flops would form a modulo 8 counter. It counts from 0, 1, 2, up to 7 and then back to 0. A counter is a simple sequential element called a free running finite state machine. The data stored in its flip-flops define its state. It has no facility for inputs other than the clock. The state transitions are unconditional. That is why it is called free running. The operation of a modulo 8 counter just described may be expressed by the state diagram. This shows the sequence of steps or state transition. The circles in the diagram denote states and the arcs show transitions. In a counter, the state and the outputs are the same. A more generalized sequential machine may be built by connecting a code converter. In this example, there are three output lines called R, Y and G only one of which could be made active at a time. With this modification, both the state as well as the output are shown in the modified state diagram. The same output sequence can be represented in a timing diagram. If we connect the R, Y and G outputs to three lamps of appropriate colors, the red lamp will glow for 5 cycles, the green lamp for 2 cycles and the yellow lamp for 1 cycle only. We can now utilize our free running sequential machine to regulate the traffic. So friends, you are now familiar with the basic concepts and building blocks of a microprocessor. In the next lesson, we shall introduce the concepts of algorithmic state machine and von Neumann machine which are useful to understand how a microprocessor works.